This is part three, lecture 10, the final one. And what we're focusing on in this is that competition matters, right? We talked about that. But guys, we, we've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, the, those when we were talking about markets and we're talking about government in this section. So the idea is that competition matters also for government, okay? And it matters just as much, okay? So let's do a little bit of review. We have to think, when do incentives matter? Well, the answer is always, okay, so what about for the government? Does it do, do incentives matter for, for government? Yeah, of course, yes. Incentives matter in the private sector, incentives matter in the public sector. All right, let's review a little bit more. What causes growth? Well, in section two, or in part two, all those sections, we talk about all the things that lead to growth, private property, free trade, competition, monetary stability, right? This idea that we protect the individual, that's what leads to growth, right? And as we've been talking, you know, through the second section, uh, through the second part, as well as through this part, is that it's not, you know, more government, right? It, it, government's not the goal. Government sets us up so that we can have these, right? It shouldn't be that, that the government is going to be our savior. It's that government enables us to have these things that I've highlighted in orange. And by having these things, we'll have growth, right? Uh, it's individuals. That's leading the protection of individuals' rights and, and letting them trade and compete. That's going to lead to growth, okay? Not having more rules and, 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 and regulations, yeah? So um, one thing that governments struggle with is that there's no incentives, right? Walmart has an incentive to be a good business because if, if they're not a good business, they're, gonna, they're not going to be a business for very long, is there, right? But for governments, what if they're not a good government? <laughs> it doesn't matter. They're still going to be the government, right? Um, th there's no competition, okay? There's no incentive to, to innovate. There's no incentive to cut costs or become more productive because... You, what are you going to do, right? Here in, in, in the United States, the federal government being as powerful as it is, you know, if you're not a fan of, you know, federal income taxes, sorry, what are you going to do? You move to another country? I mean, some people could do that, right? Some people could move to Canada. You can move to Mexico. Great weather, always, right? Um, you know, there's nowhere you can move, really, in the United States to get, rid of, get out of that rule of the federal government, right? So there's less competition, yeah? Um, so, so maybe some inefficient programs that they're allowed to linger because, well, no one's, you know, if, if Walmart's selling something that's inefficient, they just stop selling it. The government's doing something that's inefficient. They don't have to stop selling it. They're still going to be able to be the government, right? They're not going to, you know, the, 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 no one's necessarily going to be punished. Uh, a politician may not be voted in by a certain district, but another politician that voted for it may be able to stay in, you know, uh, based on what district they're in, right? And a lot of times you'll see this. Uh, with government programs, if, if a project fails, the solution isn't, you know what, <sighs> this program failed because it was a bad program and we're just going to remove it. It's, we didn't give this program enough money, we need to give this program more money, that way the program can be effective. Yeah? Um, if you look at something like uh, a, a private sector program, if it doesn't return profit, sure, they may try it again. But eventually, they're going to cut the they're going to cut the program, right? They're going to stop funding. It's like, okay, look, for the past ten years, we've tried this thing. For the past thirty years, we've tried this thing. It hasn't worked. Let's drop it. A, a, a company running a program at a loss for thirty years would be astounding to me. Um, I, I, I'm curious what the longest uh, stretch is for a private company running something at a loss, right? I know Amazon ran at a loss for the first six years so it could develop market share, right? Become a, they, they took all of the dividends from the company, all the returns that were gonna be shared to the profit holders and reinvested in the program, reinvested them in the, uh, in the company. But, you know, there was an idea that this would lead to something more in the future. Um, but, you know, with, with government projects, when they fail, a lot of times it's gonna be pump more money into it, right? Uh, we, we see we've talked about this with uh, the the welfare um, projects that we have, right? Poverty has not been changed here in the states, even though we've increased the amount of money that's been going to welfare programs. Um, people are not more educated today, despite us spending way more money on education than we have in previous years. Um, you know, when a project fails, we we just pump more money into it, right? Whereas in the private market, if something fails, then we stop doing that thing, right? If something's a loss, we don't do it, right? But if something's a loss in the government, it means fund it more. Whereas in the, in the free market, when we're looking at productivity, if something's not productive, we don't do it, right? Um, there, there's no profit and loss, essentially, is what I'm saying for the public sector, for government, okay? So what we really need in government is competition, right? Because if government had to worry about doing unproductive things with taxpayer dollars and losing those taxpayers, like if I could pay my taxes to a different government, um, 
then they would be in trouble, okay? So if we can somehow increase competition, this will give these governmental units essentially a way to compete with one another, okay? So decentralized government, allowing more areas to kind of have control over what's happening, right? Essentially uh, what the author talks about is, you know, people being able to have uh, just a decentralized government over them as opposed to a centralized government over them, right? Because if people don't like what's happening in the United States, it means they have to move to a whole new country. But if it was instead, people don't like what's happening in Indiana, they can move somewhere else. For example, people don't like what's going on in California right now. So there are some folks leaving California and going somewhere else because they're not too happy uh, with how the government is, is providing for them, okay? How the government is using their tax dollars, right? Or how much the government is going to take from them in taxes, okay? So if we increase competition among decentralized governmental units or between the government and private sector, this creates incentives, yeah? So if they're competing uh, with, you know, whether it's with other governments, right? Imagine if there were some different BMVs, right? Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Okay. They are infamous for taking so long to process people, take their picture and get them to sign documents. Uh, imagine if there were competing bureaus that you could go to, right? Uh, the, essentially, if, if the one bureau wants to have customers that are going to pay the fees to them, they're going to have to be a better bureau, right? So because of this, both of these bureaus are going to be competing with one another and offering better and better service. Yeah, we've seen this happen as FedEx and UPS have entered the, the foray into providing mail services, right? The United States Postal Service has had to step up and provide a better service. Otherwise, <laughs> they're, they're gonna be sit doing nothing, okay? Um, so you gotta wonder how do people, like people in a supermarket, they vote for what products they want with their dollars, right? Well, people vote for what state they want, they vote for what government they want with their feet. Yeah. So if it's a decentralized system, which the United States right now is relatively centralized, right? The, the federal government has a lot of power. People can vote with their feet. Yeah. Um, so long as moving to another state or moving to another government municipality uh, would end up being, you know, having, having some different costs and different benefits on them. Right. Um, if, if the government were all just instead of having states, we just had the federal government, right, that, that, that governed everywhere people wouldn't be able to vote with their feet, right? Government, governmental units, small governmental units, they wouldn't exist. But when we have small governmental units, it enables these small governmental units to be focused on providing for citizens what's best for those citizens, right? They have to take uh, you know, enough taxes and provide the, the programs that people want, yeah? Uh, they, they can't take too much in taxes and they can't provide programs that people don't want, yeah? Uh, so people are gonna be voting with their feet, yeah? They, they have to, to, to sell the best product for the lowest cost, right? I say sell because, well, it's not really selling. It's involuntary still, right? So I want to watch this video. The man with the mustache is here to take us away. And this is a good example of competing with government and what it could, I don't know, one imaginative way of what it could look like. So let's have a listen. How can we live free? Government imposes so many rules, many of which we don't agree with. So what could we do? Not happy with the way government runs? How about starting your own country? I should buy a boat. In the ocean. It's called seasteading. The idea is that if people move at least 12 miles offshore, they can build their own cities or country and live free from government suffocating rules. Unfortunately, nothing like this has been built yet. This is just an animation showing what seasteads might look like in the future. To the first seastead. But this year, Chad and Nadia Elwartowski set up this small seastead 13 miles off the coast of Thailand. We're looking forward to freedom-loving people to come join us out uh, in the open ocean. As long as people can create these seasteads voluntarily and people can quit them voluntarily, then you'll have a market of competing governance programs. Joe Quirk runs the Seasteading Institute, which promotes the floating island. We need a new place to experiment with new rules appropriate for modern technologies. What a great idea. Unfortunately, that first seastead recently came to a bad end. More on that shortly, but first, let's hear more about the idea. Innovators innovating in the 21st century are being held back by rules written in the 1970s. But we need some rules. Seasteaders don't have a problem with regulations per se. Humans need rules to interact. We have a problem with the monopoly over the provision and enforcement of regulations. Liberate humanity from politicians. 
Yes. We don't need politicians. They're not smart enough to make decisions for us. Without American rules, some will be shooting up heroin or abusing children. We have that in our country right now. But if I move 12 miles offshore, I'm going to be so incentivized to set a better example because the world's eyes are going to be on me. I got to convince investors to invest in it. I got to convince people to move there. I got to convince people to take jobs there. I think in such an environment, it's going to be much more difficult to create uh, evil islands of heroin shooting than it is to create positive innovations that improve people's lives. We at Carnival believe fun is a choice. So we have this example of, you know, if we had a bunch of, not just one of these CSTEs, but we have a bunch of them, then there'd be competition, right? Because all of them would have different rules and regulations. You can go to whichever one you think is best, right? He says the world already has a form of CSTEs, the cruise ship. Most cruise ships fly the flag of, say, Panama or Liberia, and they're sort of de facto self-governing. Um, Liberia has no capacity to, like, enforce rules on the three and a half thousand ships that fly its flag. So a captain is a, is a de facto dictator. Why doesn't he become a tyrant? And the answer is, is because people can choose another cruise line. The Seasteading Institute approaches politicians, saying, We'll bring our own land. We'll float just offshore. And if it succeeds, we share in the prosperity. If it fails, we absorb the cost. Mines can be opened to a little bit more freedom a little further out to shore. Mines were opened in China when tiny Hong Kong shows that having fewer rules could bring prosperity. China very rapidly, because of the example set by Hong Kong, started creating these special economic zones. Special economic zones are similar to Seastead. They have fewer rules. At least a half billion Chinese people have exited extreme poverty by moving to these new jurisdictions. So why don't the Chinese leaders or any political leaders say, this works, we'll do it for the whole country? Never for the whole country. Why not? I would. I would too, but that's why you and I don't have political power. Unfortunately, in China, those with political power didn't want to give it up. They did not expand freedom to the whole country. So something like seasteading would be an important experiment. Chad and Nadia hoped their seastead would be the first of many. Uh, it's going to grow bigger and bigger. They thought they would do a demonstration project of this tiny cabin and demonstrate the world that they can make it cheap. And they thought nobody would care. To everyone's surprise, uh, the Thai Navy took exception to this. Two aspiring seasteaders have had their property raided by Oops. the Thai Navy. Chad and Nadia left their island shortly before the raid. They got nervous when they saw a reconnaissance plane flying overhead. Now they're on the run. They could, in theory, face the death penalty for uh -oh. violating Thai sovereignty. That would be quite a price for trying to live on the high sea. <laughs> it's irresponsible not to <laughs> improve society by setting better examples. And I think people with the best ideas should be given an opportunity to do that voluntarily and pay the consequences of their failures and get the profits if they succeed. Good for Chad and Nadia for trying. Okay. So the idea here is that, hey, by doing this, there'd be competition among governments. But of course, um, you know, if it were something like, you know, if we didn't have a, a, the federal government as powerful as it was, then we would have competition among all these areas, right? If state governments weren't as powerful as they were, there would be competition among, you know, city governments, right? So let's go ahead and uh, finish up here with what the book recommends. So what, what are some changes that it recommends at the end of this chapter? We already talked about some in the previous section as we talked about you know fixes to the, the government debt problem. Um, but th there, there were some things that the book talked about in general to you know what could aid governments in being able to provide more for their you know people that they rule, okay? Well, the first thing is that, you know, we have a right to essentially exporting, but we don't have a right to trade in general, right? You can't import whatever you want. So one of the things the book recommends is that there should be a uh, restriction on uh, how much the government can restrict your imports, right? So in the same way that the government cannot tell you how much you can export, the government should also, shouldn't also, should also uh, not be telling you that you can't import certain things, right? So you should have a, you should have a right to trade, right? Um, I, I, I I think the idea here is that you know we have a right to free speech, right? Expressing yourself that way. In the same way, you should be able to make whatever you want and buy whatever you want and sell whatever you want and so on. Okay. 
Uh, and of course, we talked about this a whole lot with uh, in the last section we were talking about deficits, but of course they recommended the uh, three-fourths majority, right? And the idea here is that it would lead to less deficits. Okay, so guys, that's all I have for this section. Thank you so much for watching.